Amazing. I was, uh, I was seeking the Lord on, on what to share at this service. Last month, Adam, uh, Pastor Adam, who will, uh, in fact, Adam will be here on December the 17th, kind of his last Sunday here in San Jose, because now he's so busy in Morgan Hill. I said, son, you got to come up and preach one more sermon to the people because they miss you. In fact, a lot of people are missing him because they're going down to that church now, <laughs> our church, which is, which is great. So Adam's going to be here on the 17th. But uh, I was there, uh, Larry, Loretta, and a few of us went down there, and I, I shared a word, and I'm going to take portions of it because I think it fits what we're, what we're celebrating today. And by the way, yesterday, it was wonderful seeing all these families getting blessed by you guys and... Thank you, thank you so, so much. And, and from Carl and I, uh, she's fighting a little bit of a, a chest cold, but she'll be here the next service, I pray. But we just want to say happy Thanksgiving to all you guys. Um, wherever you go, if you stay home, uh, enjoy. If you're driving, flying, be safe. And let's all get back together next Sunday, Lord willing. And uh, I believe he is. Let me open with Acts chapter 8 and verse 26 and... This is apropos. I'm going to read down to verse 37 on our, seven, on our 37th. <laughs> In fact, Larry texted me, or no, Rick texted me the other day. I'm 73. You reverse that. It's 37. And of course, you know, Rick and Numbers, he, got, he had a whole little teaching in there, which is pretty interesting. But we're going to read down to verse 37 on our 37th anniversary. You ready? Here we go. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. And of course, we know it's Isaiah 53 around verses 7 and 8. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before its shear is silent, he opened not his mouth in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered or asked Philip and said, of whom does the prophet say of this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Yeah. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. If you believe with all your heart, you may. <laughs> and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Would you stand up with me just for a moment? Father, as I do my best to unwrap this with proper exegesis, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, this is an extremely important word for everybody within the sound of my voice. I pray right now that they receive this as a rhema for today on this anniversary Sunday in Jesus' name. And the saints said, amen. amen, amen, amen. I want you to say this after me. Be seated, everybody. I want you to say this after me. Lord, help me, Lord, help me. be an answer. That's yes. so what we're going to talk about today. Lord, help me be an answer to somebody or to a lot of somebodies. I think you would agree with this statement. The world we live in is troubled. People are worried. Well, they should be. What's going on? Unspeakable evil, violence, senseless killings. The weather seems to be going bonkers, if you will. Uh, just recently, fires, unprecedented fires up north. We're still shaking our head at the devastation in beautiful Sonoma and the wine country and lives lost, property, and other things, of course. So people have questions. I've never seen 
this world have so many questions. A lot of interesting people in the Bible had problems and challenges, and it's amazing how, how God would always have somebody with an answer close by. I was driving in this morning, I was listening to Joel Osteen, and he shared a portion of scripture that I'm going to insert into my little message this morning, where Naaman, the great Syrian general or captain of the army who reported only to the king, was one of the most famous men in all of Syria who had just conquered Israel, but he had leprosy. And he, he hid it by wearing his armor everywhere. But at home, he had a little teenage Jewish slave girl. And she, she got up the muster to go to her, her master and, and sir... Uh, could I have a word with you, if I, if I may uh, uh, use my own interpretation a little bit of this? Uh, uh, you know, uh, sp let me just speak into this a little bit. Sir, uh, there's a prophet in my country who has a healing ministry, and I think he could heal you of your leprosy. Now, now, Naaman had to humble himself, first of all, to listen to a teenage Jewish girl. He had just conquered her country. And to actually go and seek Elijah the prophet to see perhaps if there was healing in his ministry. Isn't it interesting? The answer to his problem was in his house all the time. But the answer didn't look like an answer. The answer looked like an insignificant slave girl from a country I had just conquered. And yet, this girl had the answer to his problem. I wonder who has the answer to your problem right now. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's Jesus Christ. He's the answer to every problem. But the world, the world doesn't know that yet. But they're getting close, I pray and I believe. Now, family... In, in the Bible, well, let me, let me back up a little bit to this Philip guy. This guy I like this guy, Philip. Philip, the, 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 the angel appears to him, and, the, and then the Holy Spirit uh, tells him to, to go intercept this chariot with a very, very powerful person, uh, this, this treasurer, maybe the second most powerful person in all of Ethiopia. And, and he's not quite sure what he's doing in Jerusalem, but he's, he's hungry to know more about uh, the God of the, of the Jews, and he hears the story of Jesus. Now he's, he's somewhat interested in, in reading the Bible. Kind of reminds me of, of my, my transition into, into the faith. And as he's reading, he doesn't, he doesn't understand what he's reading. Because the Bible, the Bible, if you're not born again, even spirit-filled, the Bible can sound like a bunch of religious riddles and, and mumbo-jumbo and just a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense to the carnal mind. But he's hungry. He's a seeker. And so Philip, who is this Philip? He's not some great apostle. Philip, if you go back to Acts 6, Philip is one of the original seven deacons that were picked by the, by the, the leaders to wait on tables and, and to, to, to help people and put out little fires. There's, you know, the, there's little... There's the strife here and a little bit of strife there. And, and Peter and the, the apostles are getting, are getting all kind of caught up in this. And they said, brothers, we need, we need some helpers to help with these mundane challenges of life and ministry. So they picked seven good men of good report. And Acts 6 says that Philip was one of the original deacons, if you will. So theologians call him the deacon evangelist. I, I like that. And we'll get back, we'll get back to our narrative in, in just a moment. But in the Bible family, some of, our, some of our greatest heroes, including the Lord Jesus himself, raised eyebrows and questions. To some, they looked more like a problem than a solution to problems. Am I right about that? Say this again with me, Lord, help me be a solution. And an answer. How about young Joseph? This is a good one. In the book of Genesis. Joseph is anointed by God to be a great big answer to two nations' problems. Down the road. Egypt and Israel. But his brothers, Joseph didn't look like an answer. <laughs> Joseph looked like a pain in the you-know-what. He looked like more of a problem than he did 
an answer. Because as you know, if you've read the story, they were jealous because the father had this special love for his youngest and gave him that electric uh, sports coat that you could see a thousand yards away in the San Francisco fog. And he wore it proudly, uh, being a little bit of a piece of work himself at that time and age. And his brothers wanted to kill him. And yet what they didn't realize was Joseph was the answer to two nations' problems. But he didn't, he didn't look like it. No, no, he didn't. T.D. Jake said this, I have never had a hater who was doing better than me. It's usually people who ain't you, but they want to be you. It's people that don't like what you have because they don't have it. And they wonder why God is blessing you and not blessing them. And they have a list of reasons why. Powerful statement the bishop, the bishop made. Yeah. All right. Now, a little personal story. In 1977, February, I got saved. 1978, filled with the Holy Ghost. At the same time, called to Ramah in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Broken Arrow. Uh, I quit my wonderful job I had been doing for about 14 years. I was a union iron worker. I was a foreman. I had a, I, I had a, a, a great pension plan. Uh, I had tremendous uh, health insurance. I was making good money for a, a, a blue collar uh, iron worker, had a nice little house. I had a two-year-old daughter, had a beautiful wife, uh, going to a nice church, but God called me. And so I decided Carl and I, we're going to go to, we need some formal training, and we're going to go to this thing called Rama Bible Training Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My family went nuts. My sisters, my mom, oh my God, Dick's lost his mind. He's given up his job. He's given up his security. He's given up his future. And, and there's empty churches on every corner. Why would Dick think that he's, you know, and oh, they, and oh, they were just, my sister couldn't sleep. Judy said she'd have to drink a bottle of wine just to go to sleep, worrying about, <laughs> worrying about me. And, and, uh, and we're all we're on fire for Jesus. We're excited. I tore up my union card like, like, like Elisha burnt, you know, he burnt the oxen or he burnt the plows and slaughtered the oxen. Like I ain't going back to that anymore. And I tore up my union card. And I'm going to go serve the Lord. I didn't have a church. I didn't have anybody. I had, all I had was faith and passion and vision but see, watch now, watch, watch. What, what my family, what, what my sisters, what my sisters didn't see, what they saw was chaos, disaster. What they saw was, was Dick's making a horrible decision. His poor wife, his poor two-year-old baby. What they didn't see was inside me was Christ, the hope of their salvation. What they didn't see was inside me and Carla was the answer to their life and to their eternity. So sometimes, watch now, when the favor of God is on you, and you are somebody's answer, they're gonna see more of a problem than an answer. You just have to keep on keeping on and trust in Jesus that the timing will happen when the answer comes to the fore. Adam, my son Adam, 1989, it was Halloween. Perhaps you heard the story. I'll rehearse it quickly. He's dressed up like Zorro going to a masquerade party. Cocaine, alcohol, weed girlfriend, all kinds of things. And yet his daddy's a preacher and he's watching me on TV, kind of clandestine, watching me on TV. And uh, he goes to this party dressed up like Zorro, mask, got the sword. And he's looking at his friends, getting drunk and high and acting like fools. Of course, he was usually with them, he said. And he said, I'm done with this. And he's walking, he's walking home looking like Zorro. And he looks up in the sky, he says, God, if you're real, I need to know right now. God, if you're real, like my dad thinks you're real, if you're real. He gets home. Remember the old answering machines? Remember the answering machines? Beep, the little, the little light. And he sees, he picks it up. It's Carla. Carla hadn't talked to Adam in eight months. And he picked up the phone. Adam, it's Carla. I don't know what's going on. I'm praying for you. You need to come to our house right now. It's like 11 o'clock Halloween night. 
I'm in bed. I passed out candy. I'm in bed. I'm in bed. Got my jammies on. I'm in bed. And Carla goes, honey, Adam's coming over. I said, what? Is it, Adam's coming over. I go, what? What? We lived way down in Morgan Hill. Well, is he okay? Well, I don't know. God told me to call him today. I don't know what's going on. Just God told me to call him. I don't know. Now, Adam had never been to our church. He had no interest in all this stuff. So he comes. He comes. Zorro comes to my house. And even though I prayed with him when he was 12 to accept Jesus, uh, it didn't turn into him walking with the Lord. Now he's, 20, now he's 25 years old. This is 13 years later. And he gets gloriously saved in my house. Watch. Watch. It was an answering machine that answered his prayer. God, if you're real, I need to hear from you tonight. Carla's picking up her 15-year-old sister from a dance in Paradise, California, the year after I got saved. There's a guy hitchhiking, a kid from, from Texas. I think he was from, from Dallas that had, you know, those big Mayflower uh, furniture. Well, he, had, he had, had brought a load of furniture to a home. Somebody had transferred or retired from, from Texas to up in Paradise where we were living. And he went to a little beer bar, uh, one of my old hangouts in the old days. And he went to a little beer bar that great iced tea there, by the way. <laughs> anyway, I went to a little beer bar, and, uh, and he's hitchhiking back to his, because uh, he couldn't park his truck. He had to hitchhike back to his hotel. And Carla sees him, her 15-year-old sister, and Carla pulls over, and Penny goes, what are you doing? Auntie, don't pick up men. She goes, God told me to pick him up. And my little, my little Dotson pick up. So they scoot over, he gets in, and uh, thank, thank you, thank you, ma'am. And she goes, uh, God told me to pick you up. Well, on his second beer, he put his beer down. He'd been, he'd, I guess his wife or mother had been witness to him. And he's drinking a beer, and he sets the beer down. And he says, God, if you're real, I need to hear from you right now. I need to hear from you. And she said, God told me to pick you up. He goes, ma'am, you're not going to believe this. I just asked God to show himself. She goes, I'm taking you home. You need me and my husband. Again, I'm in bed. I'm in bed. I had to get up at four in the morning. I'm an iron worker. I had to drive to Sacramento, 105 miles away. I go to bed at eight o'clock, get up at, I had to get up at four and, and be, at, be at the job at seven o'clock. And she, honey, honey, honey. She goes, honey, honey, honey. What? What? She goes, there, there's a man in the front room. I, you know, I'm looking for my gun. Like, what? Yeah, I'm looking for my gun. <laughs> Pastor's always packing. He's always packing. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor. And I'm, uh, and I'm serious. I'm always packing. I don't. You don't want to try to carjack me. You don't want to break into my house. You don't want to break into the church. No, you don't. Anyway, so I'm, I'm reaching for, my, I'm reaching for my, my piece. And she goes, no, 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 honey. I brought him home. Now I'm looking at her. Now I'm, now I'm really looking for my gun. <laughs> she goes, honey. And she told me the story real quick. And I, she goes, uh, he, needs, he needs to get saved and baptized with the Holy Spirit. So... I put my robe on. He's, sitting, he's just sitting there, this cute little 25-year-old kid, 24, just sitting there with a real Texas accent. So I interviewed him a little bit, laid hands on him, and he got gloriously saved, started speaking in tongues, started crying. And, and, and we got his address and stayed, stayed in touch with him. My 30th birthday, I'm, as you know, most of you know the story, I was in Utah building a iron worker. I was building a building up there in Ogden, uh, Ogden, Utah, about 50 miles north of Salt Lake. And I was listening to my old, one of my buddies now, as you know, is Jim Brown. And he was doing the color for the Muhammad Ali, uh, uh, George Foreman fight, the rumble in the jungle in Zaire, Africa. And when the fight was over, of course, I grabbed my whiskey, grabbed my cigarettes and borrowed a truck from, from uh, Gary, the, the uh, carpenter. And I drove up to the Wasatch Mountains, Pine View Lake, and I'm looking up in the sky I'm 30 years old. I'm another man's raising my son, Adam. I don't have anybody in my life. Grandma, grandpa died. Daddy died just recently. And depression and just a morbid thing came over me. I couldn't drink fast enough to ease the pain. And I looked up into the dark sky and I said, God, I could use a little help. 
and start snowing. I laid there until I was covered in snow. I didn't hear, I didn't see angels. I didn't hear voices. I just took another swig, threw my cigarette away. What I didn't realize was six months later, God was going to miraculously have me meet this little blonde named Carla Fabroy who had Jesus in her. And we were going to fall in love and she was going to lead me to Christ. Carla was my answer. Carla was my answer. And I think, I think what makes me the most proud of looking back over 37 years of this church is how many people came to this church with questions. And we had the answer. Our opening narrative, this Ethiopian powerful, powerful man had questions. What am I reading about here? Isaiah 53. Is, is Isaiah talking about himself? Is, is this prophet of God talking about somebody to come? I'm confused. I, I have questions. And Philip began to preach Jesus to him. And he believed what Philip was preaching. And he got saved. Little Mary, when she got pregnant, she looked like a problem, socially speaking, family speaking. Her fiance, Joseph, when he saw her pregnant, had a problem. Our Lord's birth in busy Bethlehem was a problem. No, no room at the inn. Later, the Pharisees saw a problem. Herod saw a problem. Pilate saw a problem. Yet, what looked like a problem was the answer to everything the world is ever going to face. Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem this world is ever going to face. And I know there's things, there's, uh, there's mysteries, there's enigmas, there's riddles to life. And that's why I love this scripture. All things work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. I know in life things happen, bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, and it's vexing, it can be confusing, but this I know. As for me and my house, we're going to trust the Lord. Stand up with me, everybody. Would you stand up with me? And in Exodus 2, the children of Israel cried out to Yahweh, Elohim, Jehovah God. What were they looking for? Probably just a little help. Just to ease the pain. Maybe, maybe Pharaoh would become a little more merciful, let them use straw. Maybe cut back their 18-hour day to 16. Let me tell you something about God. God never gives a little bit of help. God doesn't even know what that means. They were asking for a little reprieve. God was bringing an exodus. God was bringing deliverance. God was bringing prosperity and going to point them to a promised land. When I, 1974, October the 30th, my, my 30th birthday, October the 30th, 1974, I, I asked God, I could use a little help. It started by meeting a little blonde but there was nothing little about the answer to that prayer. God doesn't do things a little. When God does something, it's massive. It's huge. It's life-changing. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. The Bible says, above all we can ask or think or hope or even envision, he's more than enough. El Shaddai means, El Shaddai, as he introduced himself to Abram, who became Abraham in Genesis 17, from Genesis 15 to Genesis 17, Abram to Abraham, which is, is, a, is a covenant connection with an A-H there. Genesis 1 and 2, he's Elohim, and then he's Jehovah, but in Genesis 15, we see a brand new name for God. In English, I am Almighty God. But Almighty in the Hebrew is El which is God, should die, which means more than enough. More. In other words, what you're asking for, you're going to get more. What you're believing for, I'm going to give you more. You ask for a little, I'm going to give you much because I don't even know what little 
They ran out of wine at a Jewish wedding. Theologians say Mary was the uh, wedding coordinator. I don't know if that's true, but I like that because theologians believe that, that they were relatives. Cana is only four miles from, here's Nazareth. Cana is four miles down the road. I've, I've driven that road a dozen times from Nazareth down to Cana. You could walk it about from here to Milpitas. And theologians believe that Mary was related to either the groom or the bride and that she was in charge of, especially the wine, because when they ran out of wine, who, who brought up the, we, Jesus, we have a problem. Jesus, we have a problem. You're my son. I'm your mama. Yeah, I know you're the Lord and all that, but I'm still your mama. Like, you, you don't mess with Jewish mamas. I don't care if you are God. You don't mess with a Jewish mother. And, and she's embarrassed. And this is what they say. They say that Jesus was invited, but not his disciples. And they say the reason they ran out of wine was because his disciples drank too much. Because part, weddings lasted seven days. It's, it's like Wednesday and they're out of wine. This is, this is a faux pas, a faux pas. That groom would have been embarrassed the rest of his life. The rest of his life. And so Mary basically said, uh, Jesus, uh, we need some help. And he gets real, he gets kind of religious with her. Woman, 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 calls her woman, not mom. Woman, my time has not yet come. And she goes, oh, well, yes, it has. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't, you know, you don't have to ask your father in heaven. I'm telling you, we need, we need a little bit more wine. We need a little more wine to get through, to get through the next couple of days. And so what does Jesus do? He makes like 166 gallons of wine, which they say lasted that couple the rest of their life. So quit asking the Lord for a little help. Boy, I learned my lesson. I, I learned. I learned my lesson. At my age and looking at the next 20 years of this church, I didn't say, Lord, I could use a little help. I said, Lord, do something amazing. Do something wonderful. Do something that's going to rock the West Coast. Do something that's going to shock the body of Christ. You better be here December the 10th. Now, now, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here's my last little PowerPoint. Put your hand on your chest and say this to yourself. I am somebody's answer. Let that marinate. Christ in you. Christ in you. Larry and I have been teaching. We're writing a book right now on all the in him, in Christ scriptures, or a lot of them anyway. The Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory. Okay. There's different ways of looking at that. The Christ in me was my sister's salvation. The Christ in Carla was my salvation. The Christ in me birthed this church 37 years ago. And over 50,000 people have given their heart to Christ, baptized in the Holy Ghost. We're still getting testimonies, even last week, of, of people being healed of palsy and cancer and and. And because we're a, we're a full gospel church. But watch now. God, the rest of your life, God is going to have you come across people and you're the only Bible they're ever going to see. The only Christ they're going to get close to is the Christ in you. And that's why we have to get rid of our insecurity and our pride, our ego, and humble ourselves and be led by the Lord because without the answer of answers, hell will continue to receive its inhabitants. But heaven is waiting. There's 8 million people in this Bay Area. Heaven, heaven is waiting for people who have questions to look for somebody who has an answer. Father, I bless these people today. My friends, many of them have been with me over 30 years, some perhaps a visitor today. We love them all, and we're honored to be, I am honored, Lord, to be in your house, our church home, with these precious people. But Father, the most important thing we can realize as we leave, and Lord, I hope everybody stays to hear Bishop Rick with an amazing preaching anointing. But Lord, I pray 
that this week we realize inside us is eternity. Inside us is the kingdom of God. Inside us, salvation's yet to come. Lord, give us the, the, give us the strength and the resolve and the courage to open our mouth and preach Jesus just as Philip did. And Father, I'm reminded that a, a revival, Ethiopia today is a Christian country because of the seeds planted by Philip. One man, one man witnessing to one powerful man. And today, surrounded by Muslim countries, Ethiopia is Christian because a deacon had the courage to preach Jesus to somebody who was hungry. Father, help us to have that resolve in Christ's holy name. Put your hands together. Amen, everybody.